It gets me hyped, Jeremy, when I hear the music and then I, in my head, I can say, okay, now it's time. It's go time. It's go time. Is this, All right. is All this right. now, are we back to each week? Did we do one last week? Well, this would be two in a row. Woo! Uh, Wait, so the kids, back- phone the neighbors. Yeah, so, so that's back to back. And if we do a third, that's called a streak. So right now we're just on two, we're back to back. So that's... That's 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 seemingly getting back to normal, and, and hopefully the Astros, um, well, played better so that we can get into the postseason and do this every day. Yeah, yeah. I actually live by the rule of threes in my job. In in television, people like we 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 go by the rule of threes that people like things in threes. So I'll do a top three or three items for this. So um, I'm very much about threes. So. If we do well, get to a third straight week, this will just fall right in in line with with the the karma that is a television sports anchor. Well, you know, before we go any further about you know uh, three in a row or three, <laughs> oh, you, know, I don't know, you know, no. congratulations on your Emmys. And, Thank you. And, and how how many did you get this time? Eleven, twelve? No, it was three. It was three. Thank three. you. Three. Yeah. The Thank you. Three. Uh, but and, really. The, and that makes what 32 32 yeah, 32 that's crazy man so you know one of us see that this is good one of us on this on this group has 32 emmys and the other one's a former scout so yeah that's, that's yeah good. but uh, not to get too deep into it but really it 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 i thank the directors the producers Photojournalist Mike Orta, who I work with here, who makes me look good. All those people make me look good. Molly Baker, our executive producer, That's who great. helps uh, kind of helps me with scripts and things like that, kind of points me in the right direction. So thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. I miss um, those guys. I what's missed that? I missed those guys. It's been a long time since I've seen them. Um, you know, it, it's uh, yeah. I mean, it's. That's good. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, huh. The Houston Astros seem to be playing down to their competition. Do you have any explanation for this? Um, at any given point during a baseball season, people teams are going to get really, really hot. And they're going to get head times are really, really not. And, and, and they don't always come when you'd like to see them happen. Um, I think people would like to see the Astros, uh, and I, I'm backing into this, you know, I promise. But I, I think people would like to see the Astros uh, continue to play well and run away with the division. They're not a club that's built to run away with the division. They're the best team in the West, but they're just not built to run away with the whole thing. Um, I don't know so much that it's it's playing down at the moment as it is um, getting some things out of their system and just one of, one of those ruts, one of those periods. And it's, you know, it's not – something they can't overcome. They're clearly a better team. Um, you know, I saw Dusty addressed Bregman a couple of times today in kind of a, a little bit of a snarky way. Like he's, you know, he's here. We don't know he's going to play, but he's getting better. You know, one of those things. And, and it's, no, it was, it, by the way, it wasn't snarky. I was on the call. It wasn't. Snarky. Yeah, no, I, I don't, I don't mean it that he was, you know, I, I think he's just ready for the guys to get back. I think he's ready to have his team. You know what I mean? And I think that when he has his team, um, you'll be able to see. I don't think they've had their club, their full club, for a while now, and now they're going to get that back. So it, 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 they're running through one of those stretches that it's good if they get out of their system now because once you turn the corner in a couple of weeks of September, if you call it September 10, if you've got a lead in the division, you're not trying to look backwards. That, that All that bad baseball has got to be out of your system. At one point, I thought perhaps the intensity of playoff baseball – is what fuels this team. And because they are so used to it, when they go into Kansas City to play the Royals or Baltimore to face the Orioles, perhaps the juices just aren't flowing. Do you think there's any truth to that, perhaps? Well, when it, when, it, when a club has had as much success, and I know Dusty's his second year here, they had success last year, shortened season, right? Um, as a lot of these guys in this uniform have. Again, some of these guys have gone out of other places, but, you know, a lot of that core still remains. You know, they're, they're still here, five or six of those guys for sure. Um, they're used to being in the postseason, but they're also professionals at the same time, understand how to take care of business to get that far. So I, I don't know that it's 
um, not having the adrenaline pumping. They're still got to wake up to play major league baseball every day. Um, you know, it is tough to go play Baltimore. Who's not very good. It is tough to go play some of these other teams who aren't very good. Um, but those are wins you got to have, because if you can't turn it on there, what are you going to do when you're playing the White Sox, who, are, who may be the best team in the American League? You got Tampa Bay, um, who, who's a very good club. I mean, all you have to do is look at Boston and what happens when you run into a tougher schedule, right? And you're going to go backwards a little bit. The Red Sox are on the verge of not making the playoffs. It's it's not. I mean, it's still it's middle of August, but they're not where they were even a week ago. So the Astros, I don't think it's I don't think it's that. It could be that if there's some complacency there or inability to get themselves prepared to play, you need to go do something else. You know, Jax is good, Hopscotch, Chess, uh, Golf, any, number, any one of those things that don't involve, you know, 50,000 people yelling at you every day. So, um, but I, I think they should be fine. And I, I just, I'm going to chalk it up to bad baseball leaving their bodies right now. On Wednesday, Dusty Baker mentioned two things at two different times. Before the game, he mentioned, listen, we're missing some of our big guns, Bregman, Kyle Tucker. Guriel's been out. Alvarez has been on the shelf. And then after the game, he mentioned when you're facing the Royals, we're not used to seeing these pitchers. And that's an adjustment. And perhaps I think that was kind of Dusty's explanation about why they haven't hit in this series. Well, when you're missing those those bats, um, yeah, I mean, that's going to affect you, you know. When it comes to seeing these pitchers, I guess you could say that the guys that are playing in the lineup haven't seen those guys because they're not the regulars. But, you know, big guns. Bregman's a cannon. He's a big gun. You know, Alvarez is a, is a cannon. He's a big gun. Uh, you know, Tucker's a rifle. You know, Guriel might be a 22. I mean, they're, they're something. But, I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're good players. But, you know, you're missing Alvarez and Bregman, you got, a, you got an issue. You know, but good, good is, is, is Dusty recognized that it's the exact opposite. And, and I know I'm getting ready to go into the city, so I got to be careful. But um, the Mets GM, inter, excuse me, the Mets interim GM, Zach Scott, said in the athletic article on Sunday that it didn't matter. Line of protection didn't matter. It didn't matter who he had. In there. David Ortiz and Manny Ramirez, he watched those guys in Boston. And David Ortiz was just as good a hitter without Manny Ramirez in the lineup as he was in, so it didn't matter. So that means Mother Teresa can hit third and, and Jordan Alvarez can hit fourth, and, like, we're good, right? Right? Go ahead, Mother Teresa, you put the Pope in the fifth, five slot, and Alvarez is going to be fine. They're not at all going to pitch around, pitch to Mother Teresa to pitch around Alvarez to pitch to, to the Pope. It's not going to happen at all. It's, he, out, he's going to do what he can do. Um, I'm glad that Dusty recognized that, but the only thing I can think of is that the guys that are playing – hadn't actually seen um, any any of this type of pitching before. I was amazed that Salvador Perez, the catcher for Kansas City, has 30 bombs this year. I don't know why that just struck me. I mean, I think he was an all-star, right? Yeah, he was. Salvi's been playing for a while now. I want to say it's at least a decade with Kansas City. I know he was there in 15 when they won the World Series. Um, I believe they beat the Mets, actually, now that I say that. Um, boy, the Mets are really going to love me after this. That's two two shots right, right away. Um, but it's all right. Better me than Steve Cohen. Oops. Did I say that? Um, he's been fun to watch, too. That's been interesting. Um, in, in any event, uh, yeah, I, you know, look, Salvador Perez has been there a long time. He's a good player. He's got 30. I looked up today and saw Shohei Otani had 40. Um, that shocked me. It's the middle of August. I mean, you know, the guy might hit 55 this year, this type of pace, 55, 58. And it's just, these are like real, like we're still chasing Maris. These are real home runs. You know what I mean? So um, be, be interesting to see. And that's why the time frame, the fact that we're where we are middle of August and that's, you know, Perez has 30 bombs. That's, I guess I didn't preface that as much as I should have, but uh, I mean, here's a guy who's hit 27 twice. That's his career high. And um, you know, he's sitting at 30 right now. Uh, so, I mean, here's a guy three times silver slugger, I think. Yep. Three times silver slugger. So getting it done. He can get to 40. Done. He can get to 40. I mean, you know, catchers have a tendency to, with not a lot of protection either. 
There's, no, there's no messy. mother, there's no mother, <laughs> there's no this mother. Well, that. there are actually a lot of Mother Teresas in that lineup. There's no David, there's no David Ortiz. That's the Zach, uh, Zach Scott theory. Let me, mm-hmm. let me read this to you, by the way, okay? This okay. From the, uh, the, Atl- the um, Athletic. Yeah. Scott is on the Mets lineup issues, and they've had several, okay? Scott, for his sake, doesn't think it's a mixed problem in New York now or even in Boston. I don't believe an individual's at bat is that affected by the guy behind him or in front of him. We had David Ortiz and Manny, and David would talk about protection all the time. And when he wasn't protected, he was just as good, if not better. The idea of protection has never been something that bears out through much analysis. It is really just getting a collection of really good players, getting them to play at the best of their ability. That's how I looked at it. No, no, that look on your face is about – how that should be. I'm sorry, is what? It doesn't, if, if you're, every hitter is different, skills are different, tools are different. It, you know, that comes from the mindset of everybody is the same. So Jason Bristol should hit like Mother Teresa, should hit like Jeremy Boo, should hit like the Pope, should hit like Scott Manea, should hit like, um, you know, Jerry DePoto, uh, whatever. We should all be the same. We're all the same guy. And that's, um, in Mother Teresa's case, same, same girl, same person thing woman we're all the same same person I, no and 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 uh if you you're approaching hitters like that that might explain some of your offensive struggles by the way but that's just that's in here or there well you were protecting jd drew right you were you were behind jd drew in the saint paul saints lineup right um yeah wait kind of- yeah i was I, I was behind behind jd drew way behind yeah dave kennedy hit behind jd drew Dave Kennedy had hit 20 home runs several times, and J.D. hit third, and Kennedy hit fourth. I want to say I hit – Matt Noakes was in that lineup. He replaced me uh, five, six – I hit six more from five and seven, you know. But I, I had guys around me that, you know, augmented what I could do. I could, So I had I was good at staying out of double play. I didn't hit a lot – you know, I couldn't run at all, but I didn't hit a lot of ground balls. So I was good at staying out of double play, um, and I was able to, to move that. So you had guys ahead of me that if I could – you know, handle the bat a little bit and put a ball in the gap somewhere it could score. It didn't matter if I was hitting six, seven or something like that. And um, yeah, no, but still that the lineup construction absolutely matters as far as who's around you for sure. That was 98, right? You were there in 98? 98, first half. Mm. Interesting. 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 Also interesting is uh, Jack Morris, his comments about Shohei Otani or, his commentary, I guess, would be the uh, the better choice of words, um, has since been suspended indefinitely, which is interesting. And, and I don't want to bring up something from 31 years ago, but I'm going to. The first thing I thought of is when he, when he told a, a young female reporter that, and I see the quote now because I pulled it up, that he only talks to women when I'm naked and if they are on top of me or I'm on top of them. Morris, who was not naked at the time, was defended by then team president Bo Schembechler, who blamed the Detroit Free Press for sending a female reporter into the clubhouse. Wow, times have changed, haven't they? 1990, right? No, I think that was – well, yeah, 31. Yeah, I'm sorry, 1990. Yeah, I, you know, some of these guys don't have a filter. I mean, what's that line about the Castellanos? And that's a deep drive in the left field by Castellanos. Now make it a 4-0, 4-0 ball game. You know, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I feel like that's how Jack Morris should, should do it. But here's his comments right here. Now what do you do with Shohei Otani? Having that account for Okay, what? <laughs> what are you doing? What – Jack, have a little feel here, bud. You know, I don't, I don't know what you're doing with the, with the. I can't even make that sound. I'm not going to try to make that sound. No. Um, I. What does it do? What runs through your head to go ahead and try to make a, a sound like that to think it's funny? Like who's going to laugh at that? Even in 1990, if you did that, you'd be like. I mean, you know, it wouldn't get it wouldn't get the laughter reaction unless you had some. In <sighs> what was interesting about all this was hearing the name or reading the name Bo Schembechler. It brought me back to Bo Schembechler's time as the team president of the Tigers, and I said to myself, "Self, 
Do you remember Bo Schembechler's first draft pick as team president of the Tigers? Do you remember, Jeremy? Do you know who it is? Swing and a miss for me. Who is it? 1990. I think they had the number two pick. Yes, they had the number two pick. Wait a minute. That's Chipper Jones draft. He yes. Uh, you know the man, I'm pretty sure. He was a uh, part-time basketball player. Well, wanted to play college basketball at Arizona. He was a first baseman. He was about 6'8", six, 6'9". Six, Doesn't help me much. He's now the head of the Major League Baseball Players Association. Oh, Tony Clark. Tony Clark was his first. I thought he went to, Stan- oh, sorry, he went to Arizona. I thought he did play basketball. No. He was drafted oh. out of high school. In San Diego. He drafted. He was drafted out of high school and never – I don't think he played college basketball. So, so he was drafted Yeah, he gave school. up basketball instead, yeah. And signed as the second pick in the draft out of high school? Mm-hmm. So Jones went one and Clark went two? Uh, Bo Schembechler was the wow. – was the team president. Pretty good draft. That's a pretty good – I didn't know Tony Clark one second. I'll give him a hard time next time I see him. And, of course, the the main the, – like the number one prospect that year, you remember who that was. For the Tigers? No, like in the draft. Who everyone Todd thought, Van Todd Van Poppel. Yeah, he went – They had the four aces. Let me see if I can name them. Van Poppel, Don Peters, Kirk Dressendorfer, and Dave Zancanaro. Without even looking it up. In Oakland? That Yeah, they, they called them the four aces. They were Hank the. Hank was a left hander out of UCLA. I don't know if he ever did anything. No. Same guy? Dressendorfer, I think, is from the Houston area originally. Yeah, I think he Kirk. lives in Austin now. But Yeah. And who's the other guy? Uh, Don Peters, who went to a small school. I'll have to look it up here. He was a, uh, a I think, a smallish right hander. Yeah, Papa had a decent. Career, I don't think Zank did anything. Um, yeah, UCLA left hander, only play was an outfielder, too. Remember that? And then they, they, when they Oakland really had their aces was several years later, yes, and that, Mulder, Zito, those guys, right? And the guys they had in 1990 in the big leagues weren't, weren't bad either. Bob Weld, Dave Stewart, um, you know, Oakland was a pretty good team back then, so yeah, Todd Van Poppel, 12th. I remember that, yep, Chipper Jones, one that worked out. Don Peters was the 26th overall pick, six feet, 190, out of St. Francis, the University of St. Francis. Where's that? I think it's in Illinois. Never heard of it. All right. Hey, uh, speaking of speaking of scouts and draft picks, I pulled up a good one. Pulled up a good one, Jeremy, because this guy, one of your – one of your old scouting reports, this guy was like the talk of the Midwest earlier this year because he was on fire. Came up, filled in for Chris Bryant. And I think he was doing things for the Cubs that had never been done before. I don't remember what those are, but they involve hitting home runs. Patrick <laughs> Wisdom. <laughs> 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 They're, they're so memorable, I can't remember them. Um, Patrick Wisdom. Should I should I read what you wrote back then? Yeah, you know what? Go for it. I haven't read this report in a while. Regular third baseman in major league role. Has potential to profile offensively, but doesn't trust himself and allow for his power to come through. Cheats to the pull side, struggles with spin. Quick bat, plus strength. Good defender with soft hands and instincts will improve once he learns to get his feet underneath him when he throws and allows his arm strength to play properly. No ceiling left, but plenty of room for refinement. Type of player that can thrive outside the constrictions of college baseball if he believes in himself, needs professional at-bats. I think it's very interesting in this report that you twice mentioned the mental aspect of his game. What do you recall basing that on, or was it just your feel of watching him play? Um, 
I got him, I think, it, the game I saw, one of the games I got him at, I want to say, was University of Portland. Um, just, it's just a memory off the top of my head. It might be wrong. Um, but he looked like he was – it might have been Stanford. Anyway, he was jumpy. Uh, he cheated a lot. When, anytime a hitter does that, it's two things. Either they're pro, it, Well, anytime a, a hitter did that before 2020, um, it meant that they were trying to – do too much with the baseball and instinctively didn't trust themselves. That stuff wasn't taught. Nowadays, it's taught to swing as hard as you can, fall down. If you swing and miss, so be it. I mean, that's just what they do it. But then they didn't do that. They were teaching you to actually do something called play baseball, right? So if a hitter did that and spun off and lost all of that, that usually meant they didn't trust themselves. Um, the other thing was he was always looking in the stands at the scouts. And he was trying to figure out um, who was there and who was for what. And, and there's a lot of glad handing and for show with that stuff. It makes it it's really easy to sniff out now with, with what I do, you know, with, uh, with the series and, and, and those things is the players who are genuine and real, that are really trying to compete to compete. They, you know, they make it and they make something of themselves. Some guys are playing baseball is because it's what they do. And, and I got, and I just look at wisdom that this guy had it in him was probably going to be able to, to, to play the game at a, at a decent level. He scared me. Where I knew he was going to go, I wasn't. I wasn't willing to, you know, take him up top. Certainly wasn't taking him one, and um, didn't really want to take him two. And I don't remember where I put him. I want to say third round, maybe, maybe fourth round. But it was, it was something where, you know, if he, what he had, if he got to a certain point, he'd come off the board. But he really needed to get out, get away from where he was, and prove that he could play baseball. You had him round four, fourth round. Yeah. But here's a guy, though, who's really become – I mean, he's a grinder, right, to last this long in the game. What year was that report? 14? 2015. 15. So 2015 um, – Got an 848 OPS this year. Not in too AAA. Bad. No, in the majors. Have you been in the big leagues the whole year? 73 games, 255, 18 homers. 37 runs driven in. Now, granted, 94 strikeouts in 73 games, but has an 848 OPS. And I finally have in front of me what what was so historic, if you will, about his time with the Cubs at the beginning of his stint. He became the third player in Major League Baseball history to hit seven home runs in his first eight starts with a team. So that's – I knew there was history in there somewhere. I just couldn't remember what – what random so, statistic it was. So he came up and was hot right away. And yes. He and he was in AAA to start the year, right? Yes, which is interesting was- because at AAA, he was, you know, he was hitting a buck 60 with three homers and 11 runs driven in. Now, granted, it's Iowa, Des Moines, cold early in the beginning of the season, but, you know. Where, where was he last year, also in AAA? Uh, 2020, he spent the entire – you know, it's funny here. Uh, he only played two games, according to this. So I don't know what the deal was. Maybe he was injured. And then prior to that, he was with Nashville in 2019, hit 31 homers in Triple A Nashville, 31 homers in 17 with Memphis. So the power, power's been there. All right. So for the last four years, he's really been in Triple A. Yeah. And so he was up and down, right? So he's yeah. up and down. He came with the news with the Cardinals a few years ago. In 18, he spent most of the time in Memphis. In 19, all of the time in Nashville. Who, who was in Nashville? Was that Oakland then? No. Is that Oakland in Nashville? I got to look it up. Hold on. Yeah, in, in any event. All of it in 19 was in AAA. It was – uh, goodness. 2019 Nashville. Was it Texas? No, Texas. Come on, Jason. Maybe it was Oakland. Oakland's in Vegas, I want to say, so I don't know if that's right. Gosh, how bad it is. How bad is it that we uh we don't know this? I mean, that just Lucky. tells you the it's just the rand it's the it's the Russian roulette of that's it's Milwaukee. Yeah, it back to, yeah, it's Milwaukee. Back to Nashville, right? Brewers yeah. back to Nashville. Brewers are Nashville a couple times. I'm tempted um, to I'm right. tempted to edit this part out, but I think I'll leave it in there. <laughs> the Brewers went back to um to Nashville a couple times. They were in when I was with them, they were in Nashville, and then they moved to Colorado Springs, which was a mess for them. And then they went to San Antonio for like two years, right? 
and then back to Nashville. But in any event, so the Brewers didn't bring him up. Cardinals didn't bring him up. He's sitting in the airport, PCL league. I'm not taking anything away from the guy. He's still got to hit the ball. And the Cubs bring him up because he needs something, and he catches lightning in the bottle, and he's had a pretty good year. But it's he signed in. You said it was 2015. I thought it was earlier than that. I thought it was only 14 or 13. Um, the report was 2015. So, yeah, well, I mean, that would have been the year. But, um, you know, seven years in the big leagues or seven years of playing, eight years of playing, last four have been mostly in AAA. A. Um, you know, he, he would, you know, where they took him, which, you, you know, we talked before the show is uh, in the comp round. That's, that's how, that's way up there. Right. I mean, for, for me, I it was 52nd, 52nd overall, not for me. And, and honestly, with, I don't care what he's done right now. That's a miss, you know, where I was at the fourth round for me was what I call my graveyard round. That was my graveyard round. Like if I put you in the fourth round, it was behind everybody else. It meant I respected what you could do. Um, I was fine with you at some point, but I didn't want to, I wasn't going to take you um, up top and pay you a bunch of money. If you were available in the sixth, seventh, eighth round, fourth back, I couldn't argue in the fourth round, but I wasn't going to be happy about it. And if you went in the seventh, eighth, I'd be pretty good, pretty feel pretty good about it. Um, anything above that meant I liked you, you know, and, there, and there's some guys that you, you place, and this is funny because this is how you construct a list. You definitely go in order of guys you like, but there's guys that are going to go early in the draft. Um, uh, the guy from Fresno State, Turner, Turner Ward, T- Taylor Ward. Taylor I Ward. I couldn't stand him. I just I couldn't stand him. I think I put him in the second round or third. I just couldn't. I might put him in the seventh round. I couldn't stand him. And there's other guys you put that are just out of reach because you know they're going to go off the board, but you don't have to get them. Ah, oh, this guy's going to go in the first round. Eh, don't like him. Second round, and eh, not a fan. You put him in the third round, I'm not going to get him there. But I like him. No, you don't. No, then there's guys like Reese Hoskins that you have, you know, going fifth round, you put in second, even though the 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 numbers on him, you know, bore out where he should be on the edge of the third, probably the fourth round. You put him in the second round because you want him. Same with Adam Frazier, right? Second round because you want him. Not got so um wisdom for me was a report where I was like, no, all right, I get it, but yeah, you know, let somebody else have it. I was looking at your rosters for the New Balance Future Stars series event in just the main event. Just the main event. The main event. Okay. The main event. event. There was a name that kind of jumped off the list for me. We got Spaljeric. Yeah. Yeah. Turn. Yeah. Turn's pretty good. Dad Um, played. Dad played. Dad played. Dad played. I can confirm that dad played. Yes. Dad, dad, <laughs> dad was pretty good. Dad knew some tricks of the trade. I can, I can confirm that. He's, I, I was lucky enough to lock her next to him for a short period of time. Um, whoa, wait, whoa. What do you mean? Oh, I didn't tell you that story. No, you are now. Okay. What is it? Well, I, I don't know if I can say it on the air, but I'll say this. I'll say that Paul, um, Paul bailed me out one day when, uh, we oh, I camp- thought it was just a general story about you guys being locker mates or near each other. No, I mean, we were right next to each other. But the story, the short version of the story is this. Um, you know, you may remember I had some, I, I, I got, co- you know, uh, contacts, right? They're hard mm-hmm. contacts. And I just went and got some new ones. Well, for 20 years, and certainly at that time, I wore, you know, 25 years, I wore gas permeable lenses. Okay. Um, and they were expensive. They were 500 bucks a lens at the time. Right. So, um, not all, not really covered by insurance. They're just, they weren't considered medical. So, you know, it's a lot of money for a lens. Well, I'm in Tampa. I lost the lens. I couldn't see, couldn't play. Um, big league team was going to play Pittsburgh and Mexico that year. Um, you know, and Spall Jarek was on one side of me and, you know, Bill Pulsifer and, and some of the other guys were just to the left of me a little bit. Anyway, um, I go in to see our, our, our farm director, Tom Foley. And I'm like, Hey man, I, I can't see. I got like one eye. You know, he goes, well, don't worry about it. You take the day off tomorrow. When can you get a contact here? I said, it can't get here until tomorrow so I can play the next day. And, I, and it was like rushing them like that, right? So um, he said, all right, you're good. Go ahead. So, you know, I went out that night and um, enjoyed Tampa Clearwater. And, uh, um, you know, came in the next day. And, I mean, me and the guy I was with, one of my, one of my closest friends this day, he was a pitcher. Um, he had pitched the same day that I had played and lost my contact. And 
he couldn't uh, – He so pitchers the next day didn't have anything to do. So all he had to do was run and play a little catch and went home. That's what they had to do. Well, I was a position player, obviously, so I was supposed to play. Well, so we went out that night, and we enjoyed Tampa Clearwater until about 4 in the morning, maybe a little bit later, and there weren't any curfews for the level we were at and in spring training. And I, I was told I had the day off. So what was I going to do? Come in there, run a little bit, lift some weights, sit on the bench, and go home. I, was, I wasn't going to be able to do anything. Um, well, I walk in and spring training, and they have the lineups, at least they did then, posted on the wall when you walk in. So there's a triple A game, double A game, there's the big league game, just so you know if you're going to the other side. And, and back then that was actually across Tampa. Um, you know, and then you had, you know, A ball, the A ball games. Well, I'm I walk in or Clubby, who's now the big league clubby, um, says, Hey man, how you feeling? I said, a little, little tired, you know, a little tired. He goes, Well better figure something out because you're playing. I look to the wall and I'm hitting fifth. I'm like, what are we doing? And I said, where, I said, I said, Westy, where's Foley? He said, don't, you're playing. I said, all right. So I went and go sat down in my locker. Now I got one eye. I've had no sleep. Right. And I got to go play in this, in this game. It's triple A game day. And I'm sitting there next to Paul, Spall Jarrett and Spall, Spall is looking at me and I'm just like this, like this, he goes, you're all right? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. He goes, what's wrong? I said, I went out. We enjoyed Tampa. Um, I got one eye. I'm just, I got to go hit today with one eye. He goes, oh, that doesn't sound like it's a whole lot of fun. No, nope, not going to be a whole lot of fun. He goes, here. And he went ahead and he um, found a way to get my senses back and make me alert. And I went, woke up that day or woke up, snapped out of it. And let's call it a Red Bull, something like that. And I went out and got a couple of hits and saved my job for a little bit. And, and Paul was able to pull, reach into his bag of tricks and give me like a Red Bull. And I was able to go play <laughs> and get some hits. So when Turner came through, I called him up and I said, hey, man, there's no chance. We, it was like a month, month and a half. We were next to each other. There's no chance you're going to remember this. But this is what happened in, in, in uh, the year 2001. And you saved my job and your kid came through. And he's got a starter delivery. He's prototypical body. Might be Adam Wainwright. It's uh, you know, it's, it's a plus curveball, plus change up ninety three right now. And he's a first rounder. And he goes, well, first of all, you're welcome for saving my, my job. And he goes, that's great to hear, man. It's great. And we just kind of we talked for a bit, and um, it went on. Paul, Paul's a, a good dude. It's good to see Turner. Turner's got a chance to be an early round draft pick. He's he's what they look like, man. He's fun. Paul ended up pitching 195 games in the major leagues. 195. How many years? I know it was in Seattle for a while. Six years. But you're talking a couple of seasons with more than 50 games pitched. 97, he split time between Toronto and Seattle. He pitched 57 games. And then 98 with Seattle, he pitched 53 games. In 99, he split time between Toronto and Philadelphia. Of course, he came up with the Blue Jays. I remember him as uh, as coming up through the Toronto system. Yeah. Which is I mean, certainly a big deal for him since he's Canadian and being drafted by a Canadian team. Yeah, the Blue Jays. No, he, look, he's a great dude. He still lives up there, and he just when his career was over, I guess. I didn't want to say his last year of pitching probably was around a 102. I mean, I think that was probably it. Um, You're exactly right. It was 01. He was in the yeah. Indian system that year. Yeah. He got, we were in Tampa Bay for spring training and both of us went home. And then the Indians picked him up. Pulsifer, so he was, that, was, that was a crazy release day, man. Pulsifer. You remember Bill Pulsifer? Remember oh, that? yeah. Pulsifer. Mets, Mets top prospect at one time. Yeah, and we faced each other again in the Atlantic League for years. He was certifiable. Okay. So he's he walks, he gets released. He's supposed to make the team. Um, it's him, it's Paul Jarek, and I want to say it was Bobby C for one spot. And, and Bobby C was, you know, their guy, giving a bunch of money. Pulsford was a veteran at that point, reliever. Uh, Spall, Spallie was too. You know, and that's how you, that's how it goes in camp. You got three guys for one spot, you know. And then they decided to keep somebody else in Triple A um, for the Triple A spot, and so they released Pulsford because he's making too much money. We're playing that day. Pulsifer is not. We're on the fields at home in the complex. Pulsifer comes out of the clubhouse, 
breaks the doors darn near on the clubhouse when he's leaving, just kind of throws them open. He got his bags on. He goes, F that, F this, boom, that, boom, that. I'm gone. Screw that. Just like losing his mind as he walked out to his car and got out of there. So, um, yeah, an interesting crew that Tampa Bay had that year, man. Paul this, is what, this is what I'm here for is these old stories. This is what I'm here for. <laughs> Spally actually – Paul, um, Paul's last season in professional baseball was one of those all or nothing type situations. So in Akron, the double A team for Cleveland, and I don't know the order. I'm looking at baseball reference. So I don't know. I assume that he would have started in double A that year and then gone up to triple A. That would be my assumption. Right. But you never know. With a guy at the age of 30, who knows what could have happened that 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 year. Uh, he had an ERA with the arrows of 0. 0.00 in three games. In Buffalo, four games, he had an ERA of 17.36. You only spent seven games with the Indians that summer? Well, their minor league system. Wow. So he, he was released by Tampa and then went home. Probably was picked up at some point, pitched a little bit between the two levels and released again. You know, sometimes you forget. Dude, he was in he was in the major leagues the year before with Kansas City. Yeah, you you forget. So it was Toronto, Kansas City, Philadelphia, and Seattle. Is that right? Say that again. Toronto, Seattle, Philadelphia, Kansas City. Yes. Well, there was another Toronto in there too. So Toronto, Seattle. Toronto, Philadelphia, Kansas City. Who who doesn't come to Extra Bases podcast for Paul Spalgeric talk? I mean, who? Come on, people. Guy's a good dude. He's a good dude, and and you know the baseball family. I will say this: we do take care of each other. You know, it's 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 one of those where um, he he's a good guy. He took care of me. Um, I was more than happy to return the favor for his son, but the best part about it was his son is a legitimate early round draft pick prospect. He's a top 50 pick, legitimate top 50 pick. He's going to throw 96, 97 by the draft next time with a plus breaking ball and change up and a bunch of strikes. And man, I'm telling you right now, remember Mike Soraka? Mm-hmm. The, the, he's, he's better than he is at the same stage. He'll be better than he was next, you know, at the draft next next year. He's a phenomenal kid. I can't say enough of good things. It's just so great that he's Paul's kid. You know, it's so great that he's Paul's kid. So, you know, look, the game has a funny way of taking care of itself. You know, who knew 20 years ago or 21 years ago, whenever that was, that him helping out a, a young kid um, who was trying to, to, to make a club and feed his family while he was on the way out, uh, turned around and, and, and he ran into that particular guy when his son was coming out. And, and, you know, because they've been quarantined, they've been in Canadian quarantine, right? So not a whole lot they've done. And now his kid's going to be a legitimate guy. Like that's a really good feeling. And it's funny how baseball works, but it's, it's also, uh, it's also pretty, pretty gratifying to be a part of. I think on that note, it's time to wrap up this episode. I All love right. that story. I love those stories. He's a good dude. He's, he's just a good dude. You know, and that event, by the way, that main event, it's got some twists and turns, some surprises in it now. Okay. Uh, Should we talk about that I, next time? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk to the, I'm going to kind of let the kids and the families know what the twists and turns are first, but I, I can say this. Um, it's on the, it's, it's in the biggest stage in, in sports. Now. Ooh, I think I know. I think I know. I've been on a collision course with this group for de- almost a decade and certainly the last two years. So who knows what this is going to be, but I'm, I'm very excited to put this event on the biggest stage, the biggest city, the, 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 the center. And I grew up in LA, right? I mean, oh man, you're giving it all away now. Uh, you actually gave, you kind of, well, I'm, I'm not going to, I was going to say what you posted on Twitter, but or on, on social yeah, media. Yeah, but, but, but that's a collision course, right? I okay. mean, you know, it could have been just, 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 you know, could have been just some positive vibes. Okay. You know, get away from some of the decisions they've made with their hitting coaches. Anyway. Um, all, all right. right. That said, all right, so Jeremy's shutting us. Jeremy's shutting this this puppy down right there. All right, everybody, like, subscribe. Let us know what you're thinking here on the Extra Bases podcast.